This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Marosha Shai. This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Marosha Shai. Hello, this is Marosha Shai, your moderator of this chat, and this is another episode of F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. And on this show, we are episode, we're going to talk about my first movie review of the seven that I think has influenced either the visuals, uh, the cinematic underpinnings, or significant story elements that have been um, interwoven in the Mr. Robot uh, television show narrative, and that is Back to the Future 2. So why are we talking about Back to the Future 2? Well, first off, it is Elliot Alderson our main protagonist, our, our unreliable, unreliable narrator, our unreliable hero's favorite movie. Uh, he said this is season one. Uh, there's been allusions to it uh, throughout the show in many different points uh, in these three seasons that we've had so far. And because of that, we have to kind of talk about the show. It's been mentioned in-universe. Um, as being a real movie, uh, something that the character likes, but also it's something that is clearly has some underlying element or story arc of its own within, or I should say an influence of a story arc within the Mr. Robot universe. So first up, let's talk about the movie itself. So Back to the Future Part 2, this is a synopsis. After visiting 2015, uh, Marty McFly must repeat his visit to 1955 to prevent a disastrous changes to 1985, without interfering with his first trip. It stars Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly, Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown, Leah Thomas as Lorraine, and Thomas F. Wilson as Biff Tannen slash Gif. Uh, my take is a very 80s movie. Uh, the film is, while very good and real, really doesn't work outside the trilogy as a whole. You have to really see the first and the third to really complete the story of Marty McFly and his time-traveling shenanigans. Um... I, you know, I really like Back to the Future as a kid. You know, I'm a child of the 80s. It's one of those 80s movies I saw over and over again. I didn't really see the uh, TV cartoon. I think I might have been a little bit too old for it. But it was part of a series of weird 80s cartoons. You know, everyone talks about the reboot phase they were going through in movies. Um, but for a while there in the 80s, early 90s, there was a weird phase where some really serious, like even some dark films for being turned into cartoons like for example rambo rambo if you don't know about it uh, just google on youtube to find his um the intro for his uh you know the cartoon show itself i had a cartoon uh who else had a cartoon ghostbusters had a cartoon which i watched and enjoyed uh star wars had a cartoon they had ewoks uh, which I enjoyed a lot. Uh, droids. What else had a cartoon? Um, it came from the movies. You know, Back to the Future. You know, uh, I'm not sure which, which came first, but I know Teenage Mutant Ninja, Tur- Ninja Turtles came from a comic book. Then it was a uh, mega, huge uh, toy franchise. And then there was a cartoon that I enjoyed. And still, there's a series of cartoons, of uh, redones of that uh, television show throughout the years. Um Mr. T had a cartoon, but he's like maybe a movie actor, you might say. He had a cartoon. It was just a, a weird cartoon phase or period of time. And I'm sure there's others that I am missing. But this is Elliot's favorite movie. This is a movie he bonded over with his father. Uh, there's a picture when he begins to remember who his father is and um, begins to see him. That there's a picture of Elliot oh, when he was young, dressed up as Marty Goodfly and... Edward Alderson dressed up as Doc Brown. When Trenton's brother comes and, and uh, sees uh, Elliot, tracks him down and wants to know why he, you know, went to come visit his sister, what the real story is. Uh, they end up, as they're going back to Trenton's house to, to take the boy back to his parents, they stumble upon a movie theater that is showing Back to Future 2. And the reason why I was showing it was a celebration of the fact that on October 15th, 19, no, October 15th, 2015 is the the date. Let me go. People are probably screaming at me. Um, 
is a date that Marty McFly jumps into the future from Back to the Future 2. Uh, and begin, considering that um, the Mr. Robot narrative takes place in the year 2015, you know, this is very important. Yeah, it's October 15th, 2015. That's when he travels back into the future. And the reason why he tra- traveled, Marty McFly travels back in the future is if you watch the first film, he is friends with Doc Brown, who was his mad cap scientist that invented a time machine. Um, during the first uh, iteration of the time travel, if you will, the first movie, Marty McFly, in order to escape boo bands, whom uh, Doc Brown had stolen the petroleum, the petroleum to uh, p- supercharge his uh, time machine because they wanted him to make a bomb. He and Sam made a time machine. We're coming after him. Marty McFly jumps into the time machine, travels back to 1955, and he has to make sure that his parents actually, you know, still fall in love, which they had done at the time in the original timeline that he was, is because his father had was peeping Tom and his mother and falling from a tree, got hit by his grandfather and they end up going to the under the sea dance and they kissed and they fell in love. Well, because of Marty McFly traveling back in time, he ends up saving his dad from getting hit by a car. He changes events and he has to make sure that his parents fall in love so he could be born. And it's a whole madcap of slew of shenanigans occur. Eventually leading to uh, Marty McFly writing everything. His parents do fall in love. Um, he ends up going back into the time machine with the help of a younger Doc Brown and goes to the future. And he tries to word Doc Brown that Doc Brown got killed, but it turns out he he did get Marty McFly's letter and that he was wearing a pulp of vest, so he ended up surviving the Libyan attack. Uh, he ends up coming into a, a, a different timeline, an alternative timeline, a timeline where his father wasn't beaten down, his mother wasn't a heavy smoker, his bro- he has siblings, his brother you know, wasn't working at Burger King, he's now an office guy, his other sister, his sister, other sibling is, uh, you know, had gone to college or is doing some kind of office work. Uh, his house looks different, even though it's the same location. It looks well put together. And he has the car that he's been obsessing about, this Nissan uh, 4x4 truck. He still has the same girlfriend. But now that the car, instead of driving his parents' beat-up car from the beginning, he's driving this new, brand-new Nissan truck. His father is a writer. Biff, the bully that um, bullied his father, was his father's boss. And he used, he used to do all his, uh, his work, bullied him since high school is now a car wash guy that um, is, uh, I want to say, he's like his personality changed, he shifted, he was more um, downbeat, but uh, kind of weirdly optimistic, like almost a uh, sniveling kind of a dude um, when we see him. And so Marty is with his girlfriend, they open up the garage, he sees the truck, and he thinks all, everything's great. And then all of a sudden, you know, Doc Brown, who wanted to, to go see the future, comes back from the future from the year 2015. This all takes place in 1985, so it's almost 30 years in the future. Yeah, 85, 95, yeah, 30 years in the future to say that something's happened to his kids, come quick, you know, they got to save the future. And so the, the, the movie ends with them, you know, the, the, the famous saying, uh, we don't need no roads, uh, the, the, back, the, the time machine um, accelerating back and then flying into your face and that was the end of the movie and then they did uh the sequel back to future 2 taking place right at that very moment where basically doc Doc brown takes marty mcfly to the future to save his kids and it's a very interesting movie it's very fun but it's also very dark because as a result of marty mcfly's actions uh he ends up when he goes back to 1985 into a you know, the darkest timeline uh, shattered by community where he in- enters a world where his father is dead. He was murdered by Biff. Biff is this Trump-esque uh, and it is modeled after Trump and it's actually there's the Trump Tower and stuff like that uh, in the movie, uh, or at least the one from Las Vegas or it might was like the plaza or something like that. Um, it is like the mayor of his city. Everything's all disheveled and disrepaired. Everything's all messed up. His mother is married to Biff now. She's a completely different person. She's an alcoholic, heavy, you know, heavy drinker, smoker. His siblings who are not in the movie are alluded to as being, you know, deadbeats and 
Um, things are wrong with them as well. Um, and Marty, he he comes to this darkest timeline because he he has to fix things that he had broken, basically. And it's a very, if you think about it, it's very dark. It's a very dark, family-friendly film if you think about the dark 1985 timeline. And the reason why they're in this dark 1985 timeline is when um, Doc Brown pulled Marty into the future. He told him you can't, you know, take things from the past from the future to the past because you significantly alter it. But Marty, he didn't listen. He saw a store that had some collectibles in it. And he saw a magazine that had all the sports uh, numbers and uh, winnings from like 19, I think it was like 1955 to like 2005. It's a, it's a time period. And he was thinking, oh, I can take this back, make some sports bets, and be a millionaire. You know, he Marty always goes for the kind of like the easy win, if you will. And it's his fault, that's his trait, if you will, that uh, gets him in his predicament. And it's one of the reasons why as he's older and he finds out as he's going through the shenanigans that he himself um, working for this company and, and ended up getting the stock scheme, the scheme that he's bullied into by this one guy that's his bully, I guess you could say. Uh, I guess fa this family trait runs and being bullied or whatever. Uh, his life is not what it should be. He wasn't a rock and roller. He didn't do the things he did because he went for an, an easy win. Uh, very early on in his life that the Doc Brown did not tell him about. Uh, he eventually figures out at the end of the trilogy where he doesn't um, cause a car accident that lets him be work for the band he hit his car with and end up not having the life that he wanted. Um, so he ends up helping his son not go to prison for, again, being bullied by the Griffin family, by uh, now Tanning Griff who's like this big huge guy they made uh, I don't know if they what they did or they allowed the fact that Mark uh, Michael J Fox is a small guy he's like five foot five and the, the actor who plays uh, Thomas F Wilson I think it's like six two six four actually appear actually be the size that he is be larger uh, bullies around and uh, bullies his son and, and tries to because he and his son look alike. Um, Marty takes his son's place and says no. And, um, you know, the whole time shenanigans occur. As a result of all this happening, um, Biff, who uh, is still cleaning cars and is cleaning his grandson's car, sees Marty McFly, sees the same repeat of the skateboard incident from the first movie where uh, Marty has stood up to uh, Biff back in 55, uh, caused Biff to get his car uh, hit by manure and stuff like that through a skateboard technique, does it again but with a hoverboard, uh, sees something familiar, realizes that Marty McFly is the same, you know, Calvin Klein, which was the name he used in the first movie, same guy, sees the sports memorabilia collectible in the trash, sees the time machine, takes the time machine, which was unattended, easy to open, takes it, and goes back to time to his um, younger self, his young Biff self, and gives him the sports memorabilia book and says, hey, bet on this stuff and you could one day, uh, you know, be a millionaire and change your life. And he ends up coming back to the future, which is still uh, the timeline that Marty and Doc are. And time has changed because of what he has done. He ends up having a heart attack and dying, so they don't know exactly what he did and had to figure it out by going to the time machine and repairing stuff and so basically it was a whole back to the future too uh with uh marty going to 1985 and seeing the, the mess up timeline and going to back to 1955 to stop biff is a direct result of his actions of someone taking his personal idea of wealth the easy way and having it come to a very dark outcome which is why I think that this sh this movie um, is part of the Mr. Robot universe. I think that is the aspect that um, uh, Sam Ismail and the writers are interwoven in the story. Because if if you think about it, why Back to the Future Part Two? Really, of you know all the '80s movies out there, why why this one? You know, why not the original? The original is awesome. Um, you know, it's a very iconic movie slash trilogy. Um, and it's something that's repeated over and over again about the emphasis about Back to the Future. With season three, we have a, a whole segment of an episode where 
you know, Elliot is explaining to Trin's brother, you know, what's so awesome about Back to the Future 2. While this kid wants to go see the Martin with, uh, the Martian with uh, Matt Damon, which Elliot rejects because, of, you know, he's, he's a bit of a movie snob. He's a bit of, you know, against commercial, those type of commercial films, even though Back to the Future 2 is a very commercial film. Um, I mean, he could, we could have just left it. Sam Esmail could have just left it as stating that this is, you know, to kind of give color to his character, Elliot, uh, that this is his favorite film and, and do nothing else with it. But no, it had to, it had to place in each of these seasons. And so what we have here, if you take that story element of the uh, darkest timeline, um, you actually see this played out, particularly in season three. Um, now, I know a lot of people associate because of time travel and because of what some people believe might be within the Washington Township plant, which is a hydrogen collider um, or something to that. The Washington Township device might be something to that effect, might be a time machine. And the things that White Rose talks about, particularly when she tried to fool Angela, um, the conversation that Philip Price had with Angela when he revealed that, you know, he was her father that White Rose is crazy, that it's not possible to alter time or enter some kind of multiverse, but this is something that White Rose truly believes in. I don't think that's why the Back to the Future 2 is um, interwoven in the story, though that aspect of it might be like a, a fint, like look at this this magic hands type of a deal that Sam Ismail and the writers do all the time to kind of give you the, the twist or the subverting the genre or subverting the story arc, if you will, into something different. Um, I believe is he's using this very fun fan, family friendly story of Marty traveling through time um, into this very you know dark tale because Back to the Future Two, like I said, is a very dark tale. You know, Marty enters a dystopian future in which Biff, you know, as I said, married his mother, his father's dead. Biff is you know a rich asshole, controls everything. The town is looted that he might try to run for president. So this a whole kind of darkest timeline. And so what White Rose has done is taken, you know, this one percenter, if you will, that Ellen comes to realize towards the end, is taken the F Society's idea, the idea of encrypting um, the servers, if you will, taking their cause and subverted it into something completely different. You know, stage two, which was, again, Elliot slash Mr. Robot's idea of getting rid of the paper records, having them all shipped to one building and then blowing up that building. That was the idea. Um, taking that concept and then using it for a very dark, dark, destructive act of blowing up 71 buildings. Not because it furthered the agenda of taking out E Corp, which it did, but for White Rose is for a petty reason to destroy Philip Price's reputation as CEO of E Corp, and in essence, uh, while E Corp will rise and, and survive, Philip Price as a person will be destroyed for the simple fact that he did not protect the Washington Township plant at all costs. Um, and for that petty reason, thousands of people died, which kind of alludes to the overall arc about how the 1% um, um, over time really. Uh, do these kind of actions. Um, Philip Price alludes this a little bit to um, Elliot and Tyrell when Elliot was in his Mr. Robot form at Tyrell's house that the only reason why the F Society Revolution happened was because it aligned with his already conceived plan and agenda. It made, uh, he wanted Ecoin to exist so he could control, you know, the financial global market of the world completely without any kind of government interference or, if you will, um, the whole re idea of the revolution happened because he, you know, men like, as he says to Cairo and Elliot, uh, allow it to happen. More importantly, the fact that even still, you know, what did, uh, what did Elliot think was going to happen? You know, he wasn't really a leader. He had no followers. He had really no agenda. Everything he was doing is kind of like the, the ragtag freedom fighter group going up against the big bad was very juvenile in its scope. And what we see here, if you think about it, if you think the concept of, you know, Biff taking the, the knowledge from the future of 2015 to 1955 to change the timeline to the darkest timeline, this is exactly what White Rose did with building, building 70, blowing up those 
um, 71 building. And I think this is what is why, if you were paying attention, um, you know, was being hinted at as an influence of uh, this film in the story arc narrative, taking this concept of the dark, dark timeline, taking the concept of you have these really great and good intentions, but it's an easy kind of almost scuzzy way of a attaining a goal, which Marty McFly's was with the taking the, the, the sports knowledge and making these bets and becoming a millionaire. If you think about it, what Elliot is in F Society is doing, what he's done with F Society by destroying the entire commercial infrastructure of the world, really, and making everything kind of go to zero so people can have freedom. Um, the act of terror in and of itself is a very easy pathway, even difficult, even if it's difficult to ex execute, because it it takes away people gradually coming to your point of view through time and generation of building things from the ground up, of rebuilding a building, if you will, from the foundation down. Maybe even taking down the foundation and going to just the straight dirt and then rebuilding from there and allowing people to rebuild something stronger or better. He's he's done away with that by taking away the people the people's choice in that and being very extremely destructive. And we see the wake of his destructive acts in the background of season two and season three even more with all the foreclosed um, and out of clo closed business signs, with the fact that eCoin is the prevalent monetary currency, especially thanks to the uh, two trillion bailout, bailout from China, and the fact that the, all the world governments have agreed to back eCoin, and I guess you could say the US dollar, I almost want to say is no more in the Mr. Robot universe. Um, the currency of the... the Default currency of the world is now eCoin, an electronic currency that, uh, as Philip Price has stated when he pitched it to the Fed, um, the governments can go in and out of the wallet with ease. They can track and trace all transactions and all monetary stuff so they can go after, I guess, drug deals or anybody they want to, freeze accounts, and just kind of like they do now with bank accounts, but even more so because now there's not a counteroffer by the people with cash. And so I think really, you know, Back to the Future 2 of all the films that have influence or either be visually, somatically, like the Stanley Kubrick films or thematically, like with The Matrix and Fight Club, I think Back to the Future 2 is one of those that um, is very important. I think it's far more important than the Fight Club or even the Matrix, um, you know, influences. It's this darkest timeline as a result of good intent, kind of good intentions, but not really, like I said, scuzzy intentions. That if you carry them fully out, just like Biff did in 1955, you get a very uh, dark world, which is, which is the world that Elliot is in, um, in season three. Even with the undoing of the the hack and freeing up those servers again so all the records, the digital records exist even if the paper records are no more. It's, it's almost meaningless. It's not going to fix everything. It means as um, as Darlene and NC walking with the um, sex worker states, that means that, that this person's debt is comes back to existence. Um, yeah, people own the property, maybe even get their money back. The debt comes back with it. The, the previous economic system comes back with it. And it's going to even further wreck people even more so. Because now there's a record of their past debt, their current debt, and they're probably going to have to pay all the interest and back payments and all. It's going to make things even, even a bigger mess. And more importantly, unlike, um, I would say, the biggest themes, as I've hinted at in my introduction about why I'm doing these reviews, the fantastical nature of Back to the Future is great. You have a time travel machine and you can basically with anything with time travel, you can correct your past actions, your past mistakes, which is something that White Rose kind of alluded to to Angela about bringing her mother back, you know, bringing, you know, because she died from cancer, bringing people back, bringing that big mistake back and bringing back to the living. You, you can't do that in the Mr. Robot world. That fantasy doesn't exist. You, you know, that's a fairy tale. Um, and it's something that I think at the end of season three, with all that 
Elliot has gone through with all the consequences of his actions coming to fruition and really hitting home to him. I think that's why when he goes back to the, his mantra of going now that he knows who the 1% of the 1% are and they revealed themselves to him, he, he's going back to going after them. But then this time he's putting away his childish, childhood notions. Even if even when he did with Darlene and, and getting the, the encryption king from Dom um, that, that se- during the season finale um, after the whole um, barn incident, he still hasn't really fixed anything. He hasn't really gotten to them. You know, E Corp is still going to exist. Philip Price is not going to pay for his decisions. Uh, Terry Colby is not going to pay. White Rose is not going to pay. Um, and he wants them to all pay for their actions. And even though it's a bit of a time travel kind of a thing that they did there, where he he did, in essence, undo his actions, he's still in the darkest timeline. He's still living with the reality of someone taking his idea, his revolution, and, and twisting it into this very... Um, macabre very um unfriendly very just even far more destructive than what he was doing uh to the world with the death of thousands of people and, and the building 711 those buildings blowing up i mean we don't even know the exact complete total of people um quite yet i think they've alluded or mentioned but we don't have the exact numbering and even then, the, the ripple effect of all those buildings collapsing. We see that with the more National Guard on the street. But I'm sure in season four, we're going to see more of the ripple effects of that terrorist attack beyond just maybe going to war with Iran, but internally and globally for those actions. So just kind of sum up, um, again, why I believe the Back to the Future Part 2 is the most influential film on uh, of the film that was used by Sam and Small. Um, you know, is re- Back to the Future 2 is really here for, it, it's a movie that's here for the audience's sake. It's a familiar I- iconography, um, iconograph- I can't say it, a familiar mythos that we're familiar with. And woven in is you know like i said it's a family friendly film but if you really think about back to feature 2 it's not really family friendly if you think about you know the 1985 dark timeline um it's pretty dark you know he kills his father biff kills his father and he's going to kill him with the same gun that he killed his father with his mother is kind of a bit of a trampish type of person alcoholic you know his uh principal is shooting gangsters with shotguns i mean it's, it's really, really bad. It's very dark. Very dystopian, if you think of it in a sense. Um, it's another, you know, chip to break down our fantastical notions and well-worn, well-worn fantasy beliefs that everything is going to work out. You know, our dear hero, in this case, Elliot, um, the protagonist, is going to prevail against the bad guys, the 1%. And we get caught, you know, the bad guys are going to get caught, the good guys will win, Order will be restored, restored to the world, and a good world will, will emerge. And what, what Sam Ismail is trying to tell us with this story is, like Elliot, the audience, we need to put such childish notions away and and deal with the reality that we are in if we're going to actually prevail in, in this world of Mr. Robot. And that's, I say that, um, what's the name of the episode? It's not Runtime. What is the name of... Uh, when the buildings blow up. A kill process. That ending scene, we've been cheering for so long for Elliot to stop this building from blowing up, to stop stage two. That this is not the path to go down, to actually prevail against both Mr. Robot, Angela, and Tyrell, but also the Dark Army. And then at the same time, there's also part of us or a good chunk of the audience are like, well, wait, I came here for the revolution. So I understand why Elliot may not want um, people to die. Okay. 
but I still want the revolution to go in, uh, go on. So you have like these two um, cheer paths that people have, whether they had them both at the same time or, or chose a side, if you will. And for those who were chosen, choosing for Ali to succeed, they, they failed to realize the bigger plot uh, going on. For those who are cheering for the revolution to go on, but maybe not the death of people, you know, okay, so Ali got people out of the building, let the building still blow up. Uh, then we get the end result. We get the, we get the shock of the 71 buildings, just it, the death and destruction. So yes, Elliot stopped that one building from being blown up. They didn't even have the records inside it, really. They weren't there. Um, all those people were saved. You know, stage two, our belief was, you know, subverted, but it wasn't. And we realized just exactly what it is that we were cheering for, what it is that we were asking, you know, our hero to stop. But even for our hero, in a sense, for the revolution to continue on, what the price as an audience, what we were really asking for is we were really asking for death and destruction. We were really asking for a true, pure, incense revolution. And that cost has a blood cost toll to it. And I don't think people were really prepared for that. I was extremely shocked, like everybody for kill process. But for the audience, it was just like a smack on your face to realize, again, why are you cheering for the heroes? What are you asking for? What is the reality of this story that we're, we're being told? The, you know, the consequences, is it being grounded in a reality of that this is actually taking place in the real world? Well, these are the real world actions that would, uh, would and could if and should occur if we were to go down the natural logical thought and take things to its natural course, much like Biff going back from 2015 to his 1955 self, giving his very asshole and very uh, destructive self the power to change uh, his course of existence to be a millionaire. And that person, that, that person that didn't get humiliated um, at the under the sea dance, well, he was humiliated, but didn't stay humiliated and having maybe his personality changed to be a much humbler person, uh, and maybe even a bit of a better person, if you will, less of an asshole, if you can say, and giving him almost absolute power, seeing what that happens. Well, this is the natural course of what happens when you give these revolutionary ideas of destruction, of destroying an, an economic infrastructure to a party that will go its natural course and doesn't care, you know, about death and destruction. And, and we'll do it for, in the case of White Rose, did it for very petty reasons. Doesn't care about the revolution. Doesn't care about the economic destruction. All she cares about is the fact that she got her Congo vote and that her Washington Township plant device is being packed up and moved to the Congo where she apparently has more absolute control than she did uh, in the New York location. So that's it. Um, those are my thoughts about... You know, um, Back to the Future 2. I still recommend it, but I recommend getting the whole trilogy, watching the first one, second, and third one. You know, do 